the physics behind, for example, another the reaction. Another question. Another question. Another question. Another question. Another question. Another In the African American community, there are students that succeed academically regardless of nearly insurmountable circumstances. Tonight, a conversation with author and educator Dr. Ivory Tolson from Howard University School of Education. Along with him, founder of Grade A Teaching and Learning After School Program and former Howard University Dean of the Office of Residence Life, Mr. Charles Gibbs. He has brought a program to schools meant to enhance science, technology, engineering, and math skills among students at Focus, African American students, and success in schools. Welcome to the Scholar's Chair, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me, uh, Dr. Avery Tolson, um, you wrote this research paper called yeah. Breaking Barriers. Um, applying a path to academic success. What was the reasoning behind writing this paper? Why did you write it? Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me to the show. And uh, I've actually written a series of, of publications. It's a Breaking Barrier series. And what inspired me to write is uh, I felt like we uh, overstudied failure. And so uh, we studied failure to the point where we think that black kids are at risk just by virtue of them being black. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at <laughs> Uh, all the obstacles that are against them and all of, the, all, all of their fail, failures. Uh, we uh, uh, carelessly compare them to other race groups. Uh, and a lot of the information that we get is all about their problems, but not anything about what it takes to help them to achieve at an optimal level. And so what I wanted to do with my first Breaking Barriers report was to de-emphasize the cross-group comparisons. Mm -hmm. uh, that means I wanted to de-emphasize looking at black males, comparing them to white males, or Asian males, or Hispanic males, uh, because I, I, I felt like by doing that, uh, you were almost making the assumption that in order for uh, black males to achieve, they need to be, be like other race groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we've all found in our own observations, that when you come from a certain circumstance, there's a unique path to success. Mm. And so uh, the things that a young black male has to navigate in some of the neighborhoods in uh, Prince George's County or, or, or DC mm -hmm. is different than the path that uh, a Caucasian kid might have to navigate in an area like Bethesda or Fairfax or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to look at that path. Uh, I wasn't interested in the path of other races. I was interested in, in, in their unique path. Uh, and, and I also wanted something that was more strength-based. Uh, so something that, uh, that, that looked at resilience factors, uh, things that helped them to overcome the odds, uh, not, uh, not the, the, the odds that might consume them. Uh, so there was four sections of the report that looked at personal emotional factors, family factors, social environmental factors, and school-related factors. Uh, and, and, and all of it was uh, developed so that we can see what separate the experiences of the young black males who are doing the right thing uh, mm -hmm. from the ones that uh, weren't doing as well as we would like them to do. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent opening. Mr. Gibbs, I, the last time I saw you, you were teaching about 30 students uh, hands-on in, in a classroom setting uh, in the synagogue. Yes, sir. Ex ex explain yourself. <laughs> well, all things that have been good to grade A have happened around men of faith. So, yes, we are at, uh, located in Temple Sulel, which is a Jewish synagogue. Mm -hmm. uh, our first van was purchased by a general manager who is a member of the synagogue to provide transportation for our scholars. And What's the I, goal of the organization? We come from a practical standpoint okay. of actually working with a, a younger population, first through the fifth grade students, mm -hmm. and basically really focusing on making sure that they sharpen their skills as global thinkers. Mm -hmm. What will think is thinking about the sciences, the technology, the engineering, and the mathematics, where the jobs of the future are heading. Mm -hmm. And so starting at that young age where they're like sponges, we want to expose them to those core values. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and how do you go about doing that? What's the process? Well, we, basically we set an agenda in the curriculum, uh, Monday Mathematics Mondays, Technology Tuesdays, Writing Wednesdays, Engineering Thursdays, mm -hmm. and we actually implemented a foreign language component. Uh, to where our kids can uh, be, our scholars can begin to understand how to communicate in a competitive global market. Mm -hmm. To where, you know, when we grew up, we had a chance to walk through the door and 
have an interview. Mm -hmm. Well, now you now you got to submit your resume, and what does that speak in terms of who you are as your character? You know, I like the idea that you have this uh, this success approach that you expect success, and that you and that you help the student to achieve it. And and this is this is something that I think uh, Dr. Tolson's paper uh, kind of focuses on. Tell me. You have you have talked about it just a little bit, but can you ha ha uh, highlight the the uh, the process a little bit, uh, uh, Dr. Avery, so that so that we can get a handle on mm -hmm. on what you uh, the process that mm -hmm. you you went through to produce the book. Okay, uh, there were there were two processes. One was looking at large data sets that were collected by uh, either the federal government or large organizations. So uh, these were uh, uh, associations like. Uh, the, the World Health Organization, the mm -hmm. National Center for Educational Statistics, the, National, the, the, the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Justice. And so I, I tapped into data sets that had a clear indicator of academic success, uh, had a, a, a large black population. So all the data sets that I used had a, a black population of, of more than 1,000 uh, black kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also looked at some of these external factors like their health habits, their, uh, their, their family, uh, the relationships they had with their teachers, ah. uh, their perceptions of school. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, that was one process. And so I was able to look at uh, the young black males who are doing well within their environment and those who weren't doing as well and seeing what separates their experiences. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, something, for instance, like, uh, like, like their sense of safety and security at the school. Uh, young black males who feel safer at their school uh, tend to do better. Uh, at their school, but incidentally, a lot of the black kids who are passing through metal detectors, uh, and I, I had one data set that uh, looked at whether or not they were passed through metal detectors, uh, but these were the young black males who feel the, li li the least safe in their schools, mm -hmm. the ones who are passing through these, these metal detectors. So yeah. safety seemed to be an internal state. Uh, another thing that I did when I, I wrote these reports was uh, I engaged in the process of reading the essays from young black males. Uh, and I, I got help uh, uh, from an author named uh, uh, Cleo Scott Brown, uh, who set up a writing contest for, for young black males to tell their story. It was called Model in My Shoes. Wow. And so I was able to uh, read these essays and look at what I was finding in my statistics and compare them to some of the words of, uh, of, of the young black males. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, some of their words I've committed to memory, like uh, someone named uh, Asa Flood. Uh, he said, what about to be seen as a person with a name, then poof, a statistic, a memory, and to many a shame. Uh, and basically, he was uh, talking about uh, this barrage of negative statistics that come out there about young black males mm -hmm. and, and how uh, it doesn't necessarily help them. Uh, it brings them more shame. You know, uh -huh. if they have teachers rattling off uh, crazy stats and, you know, misguided stats like, uh, you know, there's more black men in prison than in college. Mm -hmm. And these are white female teachers who don't know anything about their background. And that statistic, by the way, is untrue. Uh, but these are things that have informed our understanding about who they are, and they're very sensitive to that. Uh, so that was another process I used, uh, actually uh, uh, reading the essays of the young black males and also having some conversations. Uh, with young black men. So you're actually uh, actually uh, offering a different narrative, aren't you? Oh yeah, that absolutely. people can play. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, uh, what is what do you see in the, in the academic setting uh, that could be a stumbling block to a, for a young African American student? Well, again, Dr. Ivory just mentioned it that he he looked at the safety factor of how our young men feel in school and in class. Mm -hmm. So we look at it from a community standpoint. What does your community mean to you? Yes. And community is more than just where you live. Mm -hmm. Community is your family. Community is your school environment. And how do you conduct yourself within that community? From the first to fifth grade perspective, looking at pre-K through, to pre through 12, uh -huh. and that first to fifth population, they, there's, there's a grade for our young black men on social skills. How are you conducting yourself in your class? And there's an A through D grade that our young men get. Now, this goes from tardiness. This goes from being a distraction. This goes from not being prepared. So we measure with our scholars their social grade. Our philosophy is very simple. Change your attitude. All right. You change your work habits. Mm -hmm. Change your work habits. You change your grades. Mm -hmm. And by being disciplined in your community, such as in your classroom, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see some changes. We've seen about at least 75% of our scholars have improved and now are making the connection 
of how I conduct myself in class mm -hmm. will affect my grade. And so once they begin to understand that philosophy of behaving themselves, their grades will improve. So yeah. the parents have a, a role to play, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tolson? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's important that we change the conversation that we're having about parents. Mm -hmm. uh, too many schools that I uh, meet with, uh, they, they're talking about uh, single parent households and different things like that. <laughs> yes. um, the majority of black kids come from single parent households. Mm -hmm. uh, we could either deal with that reality or we can stigmatize them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to deal with that reality. Uh, I think we also need to stop comparing. Um, in, in what ways should we deal with that reality? How uh, should we deal we with that reality? Uh, we, need to, we need to deal with the reality that there are some good single black parents I see. Mm -hmm. and that the characteristics that it takes to raise a successful child uh, transcend whether or not you're in a two-parent or single-parent household. Mm -hmm. So let's look at those characteristics, not, let, not, not look at the composition of the household, uh, because you could have two parents in the house and your dad's a, a, a crack dealer, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, is that better than a father who only sees their child on weekend visits, but they instill a sense of pride and yeah, success, excellent. you know. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we need to think, uh, think beyond just these blanket characteristics of the household mm -hmm. and think about what we really need from the parents. Uh, we also have to understand that, uh, that uh, impoverished parents mm -hmm. who are sending their kids to a lot of the public schools in the United States have a much deeper burden mm -hmm. and have, ha ha have, have, have much, much heavier lifting to do when it comes to ensuring that their child gets the kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, schooling that they need. Mm -hmm. Um, for a lot of these parents, being a good parent means fighting a decision to suspend your child for five days over chewing gum, mm. or fighting a decision uh, to have your child be placed in special education, mm. or resisting a teacher's attempt to say that your son needs to be put on psychoactive stimulant mm. uh, when she doesn't have that or he doesn't have that type of qualification. Mm. Uh, so, so, so this is what good parenting entails in certain communities, mm. not just simply picking up your child and dropping them off at a tutor. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so we have to understand that uh, these parents need our support and that a lot of the things that they are being exposed to in their school environments aren't things that are fair, uh, that are prudent practices, and we need to band together as a community. Amen. And so, uh, you know, Brother Gibbs already talked about, you know, how big that community mm -hmm. should be. Mm -hmm. So we do need churches uh, coming to help a parent uh, who is resisting a, a, a school's attempt uh, to put their kid back over a standardized test, test score. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it, you know, it's a lot of things that, that we need to do. Um, now, let me, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. now, let me point. ask you. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not taking that as an excuse as, as an instructor, are you? Mm -hmm. It's incumbent upon us as educators yes. to educate not just our scholars, mm -hmm. but our parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give you an example. You mentioned special ed, mm -hmm. Dr. Ivory. I'm a former special ed student. My mother bet me $50 that I wouldn't graduate from high school with my class. Mm -hmm. I graduated with honors. Mm -hmm. The stimulus wasn't that I couldn't do it, but finding momentum to say what is going to excite this young boy right here. Mm -hmm. And I thank God that my mother did not put me on stimulus medication, but yet gave me tough love and discipline. Mm -hmm. The example I wanted to use is called the student assessment report in terms of educating parents. It is a community. If a parent doesn't know where to look for specific objectives of why their child is not successful in a certain core subject, mm -hmm. they don't know. So what I did with all of our parents, it's a, it's a true school parent program mm -hmm. partnership yes. to where if the child, the scholar is not doing what they're supposed to do in school, the teacher knows that there's a grade A folder that they can put that material in mm -hmm. and that scholar is going to get it done at our program mm -hmm. to make sure that they stay abreast and up to speed. Mm -hmm. But the student assessment report, as a lot of parents don't know about it, it actually breaks down the specific objectives of a subject mm -hmm. matter of where the child is deficient. I see. Example, my son, at one point, you know, he had a C in math, and I'm sitting there saying, no, he knows two times two, he knows six times 12, he knows how to divide. Mm -hmm. So I went to this, I said, I wanna know exactly where he's deficient in that C. Mm -hmm. Pulled out the student assessment report. <laughs> realizing that objective 2.AC1 was lapsed time, mm -hmm. elapsed time. The young brother couldn't understand at first the function 
that if I'm going to the, to the movies at 12 o'clock and it takes me 45 minutes to get there, mm-hmm. what time should I leave home? Mm-hmm. Putting in word problem format, our young men couldn't grasp that at first. Uh-huh. Great with just straight problems. So educating the parents to look for and to help them and give them the tools to say this is where your child, it could be graphing, it could be line plotting, it could be probability, it could be estimating. Mm-hmm. When you say math, we just think it's the basics. So we got to help our, our parents mm-hmm. become more educated on the tools that are available mm-hmm. to help their scholar be more uh, aggressive in Interesting. class. Interesting. So, so learning the process. Learning the process yeah. is important. Now, let me ask you, I, I've had uh, some complaints from, from parents, and I've witnessed it in my own um, uh, educational process uh, where I would show up for class prepared to learn uh, and in this particular class was a history class and and uh, immediately we start off with the Greco-Roman uh, historical narrative and it, I, it took me a while to understand that this knowledge base was mine you know it was it was mine as a African-American it, because it was knowledge it was available to me but I was I, I did so on, on a little bit of um, uh, inward protest because there was not something that I could see my own historical narrative being mm-hmm. being told. How did my people get to where they are? And and the, how did my current my grandparents end up in Henry County, Virginia? I mean, you know, and the shores of Africa is some oceans away. Does that affect mm-hmm. your students as you, as you see as you do this examination? Just you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost like we are studying this other world that right. doesn't belong to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, these kids are just getting this information. Mm-hmm. So it's hard for them to really articulate what they're feeling mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, why they're not inspired by what's coming at them. Mm-hmm. But it does have a lot to do with cultural relevance. If they can't see themselves in the material that they're learning, mm-hmm. it's hard for them to really embrace it. And it's also... A lot of our education, especially our history, is, you know, to be quite frank, mm-hmm. uh, is full of lies and propaganda. Mm-hmm. And it's not a propaganda that really serves us well. Uh-huh. And so, you know, I think if, if kids learn things like, you know, the first uh, slaves to be, our enslaved Africans to become free actually mm-hmm. fought for their own freedom right. as, as Moors in, in Florida, right. you know. Right. Uh, you know, when, when, when the Spaniards uh, turned over Flor- Florida to the British, the British tried to retake all of those escaped Africans, mm-hmm. and they couldn't. And they, couldn't. they lost the battle and signed the treaty and say, okay, you all can have your freedom. You know, as long as, you know, you all, you know, <laughs> stay over here. Right, right, you right, know? right, right. So, you know, the, I think these are the types of stories that, that could inspire young black kids mm-hmm. and help them to understand that our history isn't just replete with the accomplishment mm-hmm. of white men, right. but that we all had a role in developing this nation. Yes, yes, and, and, mm-hmm. the, and contributed to Absolutely. the source of, mm-hmm. of uh, knowledge for humanity. Right. Uh, I'm, I am... Uh, very interested in this phrase that you put in your text called strength-based approach to research. Can you Mm -hmm. explain that? Strength-based approach to research looks at what will push somebody forward Mm -hmm. rather than focusing on what will hold them back. Mm -hmm. So if someone was doing deficit-based research, they would have 100 kids and they will look at all of the things that might potentially hold them back. So they might look at their poverty level. They might look at the absence of a father in the household. Uh, they might look at a history of trauma. Uh, so, th- so they look at all these things, but a lot of times they ignore the very thing that's going to get them over those things. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and also, by doing so much deficit-based research, we start to look at all of the kids as one big deficit. And so we know a lot about their problems, but not a whole lot about the solutions. Mm. And we also miss the opportunity to find out how can you survive despite some of these things and how can some of those things that you are calling deficits actually work as a learning tool for them. Mm -hmm. So strength-based approaches, instead of looking at all the things that will hold them back, you look at things that will push them forward. Mm -hmm. So, and and, and a good example of this, I I, I was working with a a group in Philadelphia. These were um, uh, direct care staff Mm -hmm. of a juvenile detention facility. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, and most of them were from Philadelphia. So I asked them, I said, describe the communities that your kids (laughs) come from. And I would hear things like Mm crime-infested, drug-infested, you know, lots of single parent households, 
gangs. So they, they talk about, they, they, these would be the first things that they would talk about, and, and that would be the end of the story. So then I would ask them, I said, well, how many of you all grew up in similar neighborhoods? And at least half of them would raise their hand. Then I would ask them, okay, so you grew up in the same neighborhood that you just described, but now you are gainfully employed. <laughs> okay. So how did you make it from a neighborhood like that to becoming gainfully employed? Mm -hmm. And then they would talk about that woman on the corner that used to sell ices that would always tell them to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Then they would talk about that church and that preacher that stayed in that neighborhood yeah. and made sure that nobody did anything bad on, on his block yeah. or her block, you know. <laughs> then they would talk about, you know, their, their mother, who was a single mother, but just made sure that they were in-house before, before it turned dark <laughs> because she knew how dangerous it was out there and she was out there in the streets grabbing them by their arm, making sure they were in the house. So, so then they would talk about all these things, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. then my, my last question would be, you know, your knowledge of those things or your knowledge of the first things you said, which one is going to be the most healing for these kids to, to know about? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? That's excellent. excellent. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we need to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, t tell me, um, you know, I, 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 can t I can say that in my own personal experience and educational process, I remember being in the first grade, and it's as clear as day today, <laughs> Ms. Mitchell, uh, who asked me to do something, I retaliated and refused to do it. I got a beating from the teacher, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Mitchell. Mr. Harris, the principal, beat me. The bus driver gave me a nasty look on the way home because he knew about the uh -huh. incident. By the time I got home, my grandmother beat me. <laughs> Sound like my family. Right. <laughs> By the time I got to my mother's, my mother's home, uh, she beat me. And my father, who worked late at night, came in at 11 o'clock at night, and he beat me. That's right. It was a long day. <laughs> but they were committed to the educational process. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm seeing. Uh, that that could possibly mm -hmm. be brought back uh, to help uh, our scholars uh, become world-class uh, leaders in the, in the area of academia. Tell me, uh, uh, Charles, in your experience, uh, do you see in, in the students that you are tutoring this sense of community uh, uh, now, as, uh, or do we? Uh, is it absent from the consciousness of the students? Well, no, I don't think it's absent from the consciousness of the students. I think they're crying out okay. for it. Yeah. It's, it's coming upon us to help get it for them. Mm -hmm. You know, during our program, you know, during our summer program, mm -hmm. we took a trip to to Congress, mm -hmm. to the U.S. Capitol, had a great tour, ran into Representative Congressman John Lewis, mm -hmm. and my. Some of my students had just seen the documentary, uh, The Freedom Riders. Yes, yes. And so they saw John Lewis on the, mm, the documentary, film. on the yes. film. Yes. So when they see him standing in the middle of the Capitol and he's talking to them, mm -hmm. I see him walking by, I, we pull him over, he comes and talks to the scholars. Mm -hmm. Now you're giving a history lesson of something you just viewed, mm. but now you're exposed and the characters are not untouchable. Yes, yes, yes. And so it's a coming upon us to expose them to mm -hmm. these things that are available to them. Mm -hmm. And so when he started talking about it and some of the scholars, I just saw you on the Freedom Riders. Yeah. Yes, that was me and I got hit upside the head. Right, right. And I walked with Dr. <laughs> Martin Luther King and one day you guys should come to my office and I'll show you all of my pictures. And he gave mm -hmm. each one of the scholars a card. Mm -hmm. They were amazed. But now look what we struck, mm. a nerve that, wow, I could be a congressman. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. I want to be an activist. Mm -hmm. Wow, I want to learn more about my history mm -hmm. because it's not always spelled out in the textbooks. And I use this philosophy, an uninformed, an, engaged, an unengaged parent mm -hmm. is an uninformed scholar. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this approach that you are doing in your program, other than the ones you just mentioned. There seems to be an emphasis on the critical um, uh, uh, thinking processes, uh, uh, algebra, uh, I mean mathematics, I should say, but I think you did tell me that you were doing some algebraic uh, equations, and you, t you, you deal with science, and you deal with new technology uh, in, in educating your students, as subjects to educate your students. Why, did, why uh, make this, this particular uh, selection of courses to teach 
and uh, how does it help uh, our young students to become global, global, uh, global thinkers? Global thinkers, yes. Global leaders, leadership for America and a global community. Mm -hmm. It starts at that age. And so what we do, for instance, with our, our technology component, mm -hmm. we work with several of our partners that come in and we, we do flight simulation. Okay. So students are now able to sit back and hold the controls to a, a cockpit of an airplane. Mm -hmm. And we bought some mock planes in where it's on the screen and they're flying, they're learning how to take off, they're learning the controls, they're learning how to fly a helicopter. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one of the coolest things that a, a, a scholar at that age can do is, is to act like they're flying an airplane. Mm. But what have we struck? A nerve that you could be a pilot. Our trip to NASA, now they had a chance to put on a space suit. Mm -hmm. They had to sit inside of a, a mock space shuttle. <laughs> I love it. And so when you are now adorned and you're able to touch, <laughs> you're able to feel from a practical standpoint, Mm -hmm. We have to begin to expose our scholars to these things from a mathematics standpoint where we have a math scholar comes in, a, a teacher, mm -hmm. and teach them how to understand mathematical equations. Mm -hmm. And so we believe in a philosophy of group learning. We team our first graders with second graders, our second graders with fourth graders, our fourth graders with fifth and sixth ah, graders. So that now we're striking leadership, we're now we're having our fifth graders mm -hmm. mentor and teach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the board. One of the biggest fears from young black males is having to go public to the speaking, board, yeah. public speaking, yes. and having to go to the board mm -hmm. and solve the equation. Because mm -hmm. if you don't do it right, what's happening behind you? Yes, yes, the students, yeah. And we're, we, we squash that. There's no, everybody's here. So we foster a, an uplifting environment. Mm -hmm. Everyone's a global leader. And at the end of the day, we have this thing called express yourself. Mm -hmm. And every scholar has to stand up there through a chant that we do. And they have to express themselves, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, but you still have to speak at a tone that <laughs> we can hear, mm -hmm. we can understand, and that begins to deal with your public speaking. Public policy, how does the method, excellent, uh, Charles, how does the, the method of, uh, 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 that you are bringing forward in your research paper mm -hmm. influence public policy, just briefly? Uh, I think it needs to influence public policy to look at assets instead of deficits, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly when it comes to, to school policy. Uh, when we think about uh, what makes a school function right, mm -hmm. you know, what do our schools need to improve? Ah. Uh, and I, I have to say that you know, a lot of things that I see emerging in public policy as it relates to schools, mm -hmm. uh, I think there are some fundamental flaws with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when we emphasize so much on state test, mm -hmm when the state test, uh, they don't really do anything for the tangible for the students, mm -hmm. you know. So we have high schools uh, in the United States who have test prep classes to prepare them for state tests, mm -hmm. but they don't have ACT or SAT prep classes. Mm -hmm. So the SAT and the ACT classes, those are for you because that's gonna help you get into a college. Mm -hmm. The state test is for your principal. Uh -huh. It's for the school leaders. Uh -huh. It's not for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything for you. Gotcha. So, so, so we need to introduce things like ACT, our college prep classes, mm -hmm. uh, AP classes, things that will inspire kids to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, we also need to prioritize the amount of enrichment that they get. When I, when I, when I hear uh, Charles talk about mm -hmm. the things that uh, that, that, that his students get in the extended day program. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that need to be carried out throughout the school environment because it inspires them to succeed. Absolutely. So. You have just talked us into the end of our program. Thanks, gentlemen, for coming. I, excellent but I, point. I want to just, just make, our, make our close because um, uh, we have just had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Ivory Tolson and Mr. Charles Gibbs. And uh, if you want to know more about the Scholars Chair, you can go online to Read One Communications uh, channel at YouTube, or you can send the comments to Facebook uh, forward slash Khalil Shadid. Um, and you can also send us an email with your comments. I am Khalil Shadid. Good night. Thank you. Amazing.